on PM Express tonight. My guest is a man who has made it his mission since this government came to power in 2017 to strive towards food sufficiency. And the vehicle that he's used has become pretty famous. Um, it was one of the most famous items in the MPP manifesto and is still possibly one of the most famous uh, policy initiatives being implemented by this government. It's called the Planting for Food and Jobs. What you may not know is that that program itself has evolved in phases. Recently, we launched, um, the ministry launched in WA, the rearing for food and jobs. And there is a whole lot to explore with that. Don't forget, this is an economy that is run primarily on the back of agriculture. Majority of our folks are employed in that sector. And so it's, it's one of the most, if not the most, important uh, uh, sectors of our economy. We don't get to talk to him much. We hear a lot of the finance minister, but trust me, without that great, there won't be finance because that's where the money it really sits. Uh, ask the many millions of the poor people across the country whose livelihood depends on that sector. And that is why I'm delighted to say that uh, joining us on PM Express tonight is the Honorable Minister for Agriculture, uh, Dr. Wusui Friyakoto. Thank you very much, sir, for your time here on PM Express. Um, was I exaggerating to say what I said, that you, this economy really fundamentally rests on your tiny little shoulders. Well, the thing is that um, empty stomachs can cause trouble. <laughs> <laughs> they do. Yes, and it's also a reflection of poverty and uh, to humanity. So agriculture for food and uh, the sustenance of the human being is very, very important. Mm. It takes on economic uh, significance because that is the occupation of a large majority of our citizenry. And also, we are very dependent upon it for our foreign exchange earnings uh, and all kinds of things, employment and all that. So it's very important. Unfortunately, in the last 10 years or so, the sector had not been doing well at all. I mean, I sat in parliament in eight years, screaming to the people of Ghana. They were very vociferous. Uh, well, I mean, it, because it was very painful to see agriculture going down, rate of growth of agriculture, annual rate of growth going down, the share of agriculture in the total budget being cut, and um, uh, flooding our landscape with imports of food that our farmers could efficiently produce, all those things, and uh, getting into uh, uh, economic crisis, a foreign exchange crisis, because the economy was, is not producing enough foreign exchange to meet our requirements and all that. So, um, and the diagnosis, diagnosis, as I could see it, was clearly that the lack of support, public support, government support for our, our farmers, was the key to what, what was going on, uh, the debilitating effect that it was having on our agriculture and on our farmers because then it meant that poverty was grinding even more to farmers and you know as i do that most uh, the poorest group of workers in ghana are farmers it hasn't been the case uh, all along but uh, the last few years farmers have been turned into very poor uh, citizens so when we came into office uh, we decided that we would change the whole pattern and ensure that there's growth in the agricultural sector. Farmers can increase their incomes so that they can make their contribution uh, to the economy of Ghana. And we chose a marketing technique that we all call branding because uh, the group of policies that the Akufu Adro government brought to the table, we branded them as planting for food and jobs. And I'm glad that it's taken such a huge popularity amongst the, uh, the people of Ghana and uh, even on the continent of Africa and beyond. Um, and planting for food and jobs is the combination of all the uh, 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 policies that have been adopted by the Akufuado government in order to transform agriculture as a means of transforming the economy of Ghana. Mm. 
because without the, the transformation of the economy, agriculture, and agriculture in this country, there will be no transformation. The stagnation that we've experienced all these years will continue, and the, the, the poverty amongst uh, most of our people will continue. So the target was because of the nature of our agriculture, which is smallholding agriculture, majority, very large majority of farmers uh, farm only one or two hectares, that's all. But uh, and, uh, it means that millions of farmers, we have over three million farm households in Ghana by the latest agricultural census, and nearly 12 million uh, of our population uh, are in these farm households. So it's very, very critical to, to the well-being of the people of Ghana. So we chose to focus our attention on the smallholders. Mm. First of all, their productivity was so low that even by West African standards, the yields of our farmers, were, were, we couldn't compare with any in West Africa. Togo, Cote d'Ivoire, our neighbors were are doing far better than us. Mm. And even uh, the, the traditional cocoa. Uh, cocoa, uh, average yield is not even half a ton. 450 kilograms per hectare, you go to Cote d'Ivoire, it's over one ton. Mm -hmm. You don't go to uh, Togo, it's over a ton. So generally, our productivity is very low. And the strategy is to bring up the productivity in agriculture by focusing on modern technology, the seed, which has been uh, the source of a subject of great effort by our scientists in our universities and in uh, the research institutes coming up with very high yielding uh, kinds of seeds in, uh, from maize to uh, soya to cassava to, to anything and which has not been transferred to the farms because of the lack of extension services. Mm. I inherited an extension service supposed to be 4,400. When I did the, the audit, I had only less than 1,600 extension officers. And of, out of, the, of this number, nearly 80% were going on pension in the next three, four years. So virtually no extension service. And extension is the link between technology and the farmer. Mm. And if it doesn't exist, it means that he's cut off from modern technology. So one was to try to reestablish the extension service. In the meantime, get seeds improve seeds and fertilizers to the farmers, which we have done steadily over the two and a half years that we've been in office. Um, we, so while we know how many uh, extension yes. offices have we Now, um, I appeal to my uh, cabinet colleagues to allow me to employ 2,600, and we've now employed them. They've gone under training and so on, so we are back to strength. And I'm, I'm even asking for more because there's still districts in this country which do not have extension offices. And extension of uh, extension, this 4,400 has been there for the last 50 years. Mm. In the meantime, agriculture has changed uh, in terms of locations and, and the mix of crops and all that. So we, it's very, very important that we, we, we have extension service. Mm. And the reason why is it critical to have improved seed is if you take maize, which for me is by far the most important crop when it comes to food security in this country, and it's grown in all the four corners of this country. The traditional seed will give you three, four bags mm. per acre. That is about 200 kilograms only. Whereas if you take the hybrid seed, it can give you as many as 40 bags. I've seen it in the Tumu area. Well, farmers have applied the, 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 this, uh, the hybrid maize and I, I've reaped 30, 40, sometimes more than 40 bags per, hectare, mm. uh, per acre when their neighbors who are using traditional seed are getting only three or four bags. And you may ask, why is it that uh, their neighbors, they, they are not adopting, adopting the, yeah. your, your seeds? It's well, two things. First of all, affordability. You know, farmers are very, very poor and hybrid seed is not cheap. And if you, you apply hybrid seed, it means you need more fertilizer than the ordinary OPV, that's the ordinary improved seed. And they can't afford it. So we decided that we we're going to subsidize seed and fertilizer by 50%. In the case of seed, whilst it costs the government 25 CDs per kilo, mm. we are giving it to the farmers now at three CDs. 
just to encourage them to try the wonder uh, high, uh, seed. And it's working like magic. Uh, I mean, the farmers um, bought into this? Oh, idea. yes. I mean, it's <laughs> all over you go, and now people are searching for hybrid seed, uh, may seed, they can't even find it. Yeah. So it's up to the local uh, seed industry to, to come up uh, uh, to the plate step up to the plate and they are doing it. You mm. can see first year we had to import seed from as far away as northern Nigeria mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, even uh, Cote d'Ivoire for rice. Last year, that's 2018, uh, imports were virtually nil and this year... For maize? For, for maize and for rice and for, for the others. And this year, for instance, we haven't imported any um, uh, seed. Uh, for our farmers. Why? Because, and, uh, we are the, we, because we, the local we, seed industry mm. is, is responding. They are, they are, they are expanding their, their businesses to supply the ministry uh, with seeds so we can supply the farmers with the seed. Mm. So these new business opportunities are all coming up and it's very interesting to see that when, whilst we were importing food plantain and others from Cote d'Ivoire and, and the other places. Last year, we were able to export over 130,000 metric tons of 19 food items to our neighbors as far away as, as Niger, Mali, Burkina Faso, northern Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, and, and the rest. And this year, we're expecting an even bigger surplus. And as people talk about rains, the rains have always been there. But it's really the difference is the technology that we were able in the first year to distribute 4,400 metric tons of seeds to farmers in Ghana. Last year we went up to 6,000, that's 2018, over 6,800. And this year we are doing over 15,000 metric tons of seed to farmers. Mm -hmm. In 2020, we expect to do 20, 24,000 metric tons. So, of high yield, improved seeds, and then, uh, correspondingly, the fertilizer that we are given is also going up. Mm. The highest that any government had imported into this country before we came in was 120,000 metric tons of fertilizer. Of fertilizer. This year, we did over 4,000, 4, uh, 400,000 metric tons. Mm. So, and the demand, you know, they used to call it, if you go to the north, they used to call it chemical. Now everybody talks about fertilizer. So that is the popularity of what we have introduced. And it's very clear that the uh, strategy that we have adopted is working. Now, planting for food and jobs is not all about food crops. That is the food security angle. We have five modules for planting for food and jobs. Mm. The first is what I've spoken about, the food security with food crops uh, uh, that we domestically we eat and then the surpluses we export. The second uh, uh, module is what we call planting for export and rural development, which is the concentration of effort on six selected tree crops. We are talking about rubber, we are talking about mango, we are talking about coffee, we are talking about cashew, we are talking about shea, and we are talking about uh, oil palm mm -hmm. and, and coconut. And these we are focusing on a collaboration between us and the Ministry of Local Government. District chief executives have been, have been supplied with planting material from our research institutions to create uh, gardens, uh, seed gardens, to produce seedlings, to supply free of charge to farmers. And this has become so popular that uh, we are hoping that in the next five, six years, Ghana would have established the capacity to be able to produce these selected crops to export to earn us as much as cocoa is earning us today. Cocoa is earning us about $2 billion. So each one of these crops should be earning us $2 billion. And the target is what? When, by which state do you hope but to do In the next five, six years, we should have established the capacity for us to be able Isn't to... Isn't that overambitious? Well, that's what you say. Knowing what cocoa brings in, no, billions yeah. of dollars no, no, it brings no, no, in. No, no. The most cocoa of it. brings Top three. Two, $2 billion. Yes. Okay? But I'm saying that in the next five, six years, this program of planting for export that we call PED should be able to produce enough quantities. We've calculated everything. We're using today's well prices. What are the quantities? To make us as much as we make from cocoa. Yes, so we are talking about $12 billion from these six crops, in addition to the two billion that we are getting The devil is in the details. Yes. It's taken us this long to get to where we are with cocoa. Because with, nobody, with many fluctuations. Because nobody, nobody really has attempted to do what we are doing. What we are doing is totally unprecedented, I'm telling you. Mm. 1922, 
Gordon Gagesberg, who was a governor of the Gold Coast, was the one who said that the Gold Coast had produced so much. At that time, we were controlling about 75% uh, of world supply of cocoa was coming from the Gold Coast. That is, it's enough production, we should get into other areas. Since then, every government which has come into office has adopted the same policy, diversification, but it's never happened. Akufuado is making it happen today. And what are the concrete policy initiatives? So, so for, I, know, I remember one of the key things that the president talked about during the campaign was to have, we have Cocoa Board. He wanted to have a, a board for uh, um, um, share. Yes, now what is happening is that. Has that happened? We have, yes, 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 yes. There's a bill in parliament, as I speak to you, is going through all the stages. Mm. And in this parliament, this sitting before Christmas, it will be law. It is a statutory body that we call Tree Crop Development Authority, under which all these crops will, will, be, will be grouped. With the exception of cocoa. With the exception of cocoa will be. So under cocoa. Yes. But these six. And, and this model is not new, you know. Uh, you go to Cote d'Ivoire, you go to Senegal, the, the Francophones, they have it. And it's working. That's why Cote d'Ivoire can raise $15 billion from five of such crops. Yeah. And we have only $2 billion from from cocoa. We, uh, we, uh, we know that we have the potential to do far better than Cote d'Ivoire. So, in fact, the $2 billion I'm talking about is very modest. And I, if you go to our research, uh, we were at Opry with the president uh, three weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, looking at the work that they are doing, the capacity to produce the planting materials and so on. They cannot meet our demand, our targets. So we asked them, what is the budget you need to be able to give us this uh, level of uh, uh, planting material? When we put it all together around the country, we need $39 million. Only $39 million to be able to establish a capacity to earn $12 billion a year. Are, 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 these, are these estimates based on real scientific? Of course they are. We are, we are sitting here. Because, this because if you say 30 <laughs> and we're talking about billion. Yes. The investment and the amount you expect yeah. to get, that the, the disconnect yeah, there is so, so huge. Well, well I, it, I, it, it I, beggars I, belief, something yeah, Exactly, yes. If it sounds too good to be true, probably no, no, is. No, no, but listen, I mean, I know countries that I have helped to get to that level <laughs> in my own career before I came to Ghana. Mm. And they don't have the kind of endowment Ghana has. They don't have the kind of hard-working farmers that Ghana has. They've been able to do it. So we can do it. And it's happening. Look, you go to the northern sector now. Mm. If you drive from Kumasi all the way to Wa, where you were, mm -hmm. and you have the eyes to see left and right, you will see the rural transformation, that something is happening. You see shiny metal uh, roofs where there used to be touch roofs. You see a lot of cement blocks being manufactured all over the place, replacing mud houses wood. You see motorbike, brand new motorbike. Where do you think that wealth is coming from? It's coming from planting for food and jobs. And we are saying that we are transforming the Savannah region. For the first time, they are going to have their own cash crop their own cocoa, which is cashew. Cashew is now doing very well from Wild to Bulga to uh, everywhere you go, the district chief. Do they have the market for it, though? No, we, we are, this is why we are creating this uh, authority to, 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 to take the market and, and to control the quality and to promote production and, and all those. An things. export. Yes, an export, of mm. course. So the target, as I said, is to ensure that the, each of these six crops will be able to bring it up to the level to earn enough foreign exchange as cocoa is earning us today. And in the next five, six years, if we are, you are here and I'm here somewhere, I may not be in this office, but definitely I'll be able to show you statistics that we're exporting so much and so much. Let's talk about one of the biggest objectives of the Planet Food and Jobs, which was to create jobs. Yes. Um, your job figures have yes. always been a bone of contention. Well, I'm sure you know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where, the, where, where are we with the job numbers now? Well, the job numbers are increasing. I mean, you see, you cannot, for instance, well, before we came in, Ghana was producing 1.8 million metric tons of maize. Mm. Now you are doing more than 2.5 million metric tons of maize. I know we can do 6 million metric tons of maize. I know it. If I'm able to raise this level with 677,000 farmers, 
I will be able to double that with 1.3 million farmers out of the two, uh, the three million. So these are it's signs, you know. I mean, it's figures. You mm. have to target certain people with certain re amount of resources, mm. and you know that once you give those resources out, this is what you are going to. So, get what out. are the latest job numbers then? Well, the latest job number we created seven hundred and forty-five thousand jobs in the first year of the absorption. It has gone up to something like 900,000 uh, uh, jobs uh, now, and we intend that it will go up. Because, okay. you see, if you are... If so you are 900,000 jobs yes. in the agri sector yes. on the back of... On the back of food jobs. jobs alone. But how do you verify that? Well, I how mean, do we it's calculation. That? It's calculation. I mean, if you are producing four bags per hectare, per acre of rice, and you are producing 40 bags. You don't expect to use the same amount of labor. Do you? Mm. So these <laughs> are estimates. Yeah, of course. There has to be estimates. Mm. It has to be. It's not population census. <laughs> of course it has to be. So it could All be, what we do uh, uh, are estimates. It could be, it could be less than 900,000. Well, it could be more, too. Depending upon the assumption. Mm. But we know that we are creating the jobs because the demand for labor is shooting through the roof. Which parts of the which parts of the agri industry are most of these jobs found? On the farms. On farm. Mm. We are talking these about are demand. Real farmers. This is not you're not doing no, look, the, the spin offs no, no, from, from the actual farming. You, you see, if you are a farmer like myself, mm. you understand what I'm saying. Mm. If I'm producing four bags of maize per, uh, on my hectare of land, and I'm producing 40 bags of maize of the same land, you think that you're, you're, you're going to use the same amount of labor? It's not possible. For the maintenance of the, of the farm, for the application of the, the, the new improved seeds and fertilizers, for harvesting, for carrying, and all those things. Somebody has to come, additional hands are needed. Mm. These are, you see, you have to be able to understand at the micro level what is happening on the farms. I'm just curious to know, beyond the estimates, based on the statistical analysis, do we actually have, seeing how important the job numbers are mm -hmm. to the economy and for mm -hmm. planning purposes, mm -hmm. do we have men actually going out there doing proper counting to be, get close to the accurate No, that, but you are possible. talking about census. We do agricultural census once every 10 years, like we do population census, which is coming on next uh, mm -hmm. two months. Okay? But Ghana, for f nearly 40 years, never did a population an agricultural census. We just finished one. So, and it's going to be a 10 year interval. Mm. And in between, you cannot say that every day you're going to count. It's not possible. So, there yeah, are scientific me uh, uh, methods to calculate what you are generating in terms of the output, in terms of the inputs. The inputs we know, I've told you, we, we distributed 4,400 metric tons of seeds mm. it, over the first year, went up to 6,800, and this year 15,000, next year 20 something thousand. That one is measured. The mm. same thing for the fertilizers. Mm. But when it comes to the other inputs, the complementary inputs, what we call in economics, that you have these items, somebody, some hands will have to come and put it all together. Mm. So if, I want, to, so if for, I want to say, take you on and, and, and verify these figures. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you can go, go? Go, go up and, and, and verify. Where, where do I go? Where do you go? You, you come to the ministry because we have the knowledge to do it. If I want to do it independently, can I go mm. into the farms? But that yeah, yeah, well, no, no, you, but how many farms can you visit? I'm talking about nearly three million farm households. How many of them can you as an individual? No matter what you, your knowledge is, mm. you have to go and count. So this is almost impossible to independently Yeah, but this is what I'm saying that scientifically, we have methods to estimate this all around the world. What the USAID uses to, to, to estimate American crops is the same that we use here to measure Ghanaian crops. Mm. It's, it's, if you've been to first year university in agriculture, you should know these things. I'm going to take a break. When I return, uh, more on the planting of food and jobs. Uh, rearing for food and jobs, uh, also we haven't spoken about. We'll yes. talk about that and what, why that is so important. We'll, we'll talk also about the fertilizer uh, part of this. Uh, the minister mentions it. it's so crucial to making this vehicle move along. Um, there's been some criticism there from 
uh, former president John Mahama on the fertilizer policy. Um, I'll ask him his thoughts, <laughs> his thoughts on that. Uh, you want to stay with us. When we return, we'll delve into those matters. Stay with us. You are still on PM Express. My name is Evans Mensah. My guest is still the Agri Minister, uh, Dr. Ouse Friakoto, who has been kind enough to share with us uh, thoughts on the planting for food and jobs, uh, but also uh, an aspect that uh, was launched recently, um, which is the rearing for food and jobs. Uh, Doc, let's talk about that. Uh, why that? Why rearing for food and jobs? This country is not known for, for rearing stuff. We are known for growing stuff. Yeah. Why was that part of the plan? Human beings rely on proteins. We need the nutrition. So a healthy body is a nutritious body. Mm. And you cannot just do carbohydrates, carbohydrates, carbohydrates. You need protein. That's why you need livestock. The livestock industry is very, very important for us. And it is a traditional livestock country. You go to the Savannah Belt, you understand what I'm talking yes. about. Every household has some goats, sheep and goats, cattle and so on running around because of the tall ele elephant grasses and so on. They have a lot of feed and uh, free ranging and all that. But we haven't been producing enough protein to feed our population. Rather, we've been importing in a very scary manner in the last 10 years the impulse of uh, poultry in particular has, has been frightening. 20 years ago, we had a... Many uh, argue a poultry industry is dead. Yes. 20 years you agree? ago... Oh, absolutely. 20 years ago, Ghana used to export poultry meat to its neighbors. Now we have become so dependent on imports mm. because the local industry has collapsed. And it's collapsed if you invest, you do proper research investigation. The amount of uh, feed that we can produce locally has not at all matched up with the demand for, for meat. So poultry, for instance, we are, we are having to import soya meal, which is a basic ingredient for chicken feed. And yet Ghana is endowed with soya. So one of the first things that we, we did was to include soya in the six selected crops that we started the program with, with having in mind that we're going to revive the poultry industry. And then we took over at a time that poultry produ uh, soya production was only about 30,000 metric tons. This year, we're expecting nearly over 200,000 metric tons of, of soya this year. Mm -hmm. And so we are in a position to have enough local feed for the poultry industry. Now, what is happening is that uh, in poultry, the feed is between 75% to 80% of the cost of production. So if you can produce it cheaply in Ghana, then it means that a poultry farmer can buy it at a price that will be able to compete with these uh, imports flooding into mm. the, the country. The poultry farmers have been complaining recently yes, exactly. that they yeah. can't afford. Yes, yes. So locally. it's all coming down. You just have to go and ask so the dealers in soya and they'll tell you prices. And, and then the processes, that prices of soya are, are, is coming up because production uh, uh, of soya, soya is, is, is climbing. Mm. And we made special effort, giving enough uh, uh, seed to uh, farmers to plant, in the, especially in the northern belt and in the middle belt. So we are get, getting to grips with the whole idea uh, of the, the poultry industry. Apart from poultry, we have uh, sheep, we have goats, we have cattle, and we have piggery. Mm -hmm. All these are being tackled in their own ways. But from an economic point of view, the most important is the poultry. This is why I'm emphasizing the poultry. Yeah. We are spending close to 200 million US dollars a year importing poultry meat, mm -hmm. which is totally unnecessary because we can easily produce 
the, the, the poultry locally to save the two hundred million dollars mm. for to cause, to develop this country, to build clinics, schools, and, and roads for for ourselves. But we, at the moment, we are using it to import when our poultry farmers can do better. So basically, we we, we are getting to the bottom of it by producing more uh, 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 soya, and then of course. Maize is, a, uh, is on autopilot, as I told you, yeah. production is going up. So the plan is mm -hmm. to make us self-sufficient also when it comes to meat. Yes, and, um, and not only that, to export. Uh, to because export. we have uh, potential. Let's, let's stay with the poultry. Mm -hmm. I know the, the poultry has had a very checkered history. Yes. There was a time when government wanted to use policy, which is um, put restrictions on importation of poultry so we could protect our local industry. It didn't I, really happen. I don't believe in that. You didn't believe in that? No, no, no. That was Why? the wrong Why? diagnosis. No, no, look, I mean, I'm an economist. I shouldn't believe in the foreign imports will kill no, us. No, 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 no. You see, you are able to compete with if there's a level playing field. If we're able to produce all the feed here in Ghana by ourselves, I calculate that we'll be able to produce chicken at a, a lower uh, price than the imports. The difficulty is that where these imports are coming from, their governments are so subsidizing heavily. The, yes. Okay, so that is not level playing field. And therefore, we need to have... You can't so, stop that. Well, we can't, we can't, you, stop, you can't stop what we are doing out there. No, no. But can but we, we can, compete with that no, no, government? No, no, we locally? cannot. Because it's not level playing field. So yeah. how can you compete? Yeah. Whatever you do, just like rice... So isn't that then the, what, that's what policy corrects? No, no. The policy corrects only when you have established local capacity to produce what you are trying to avoid. That's why it's happening in Nigeria. They, all their borders are closed. Mm. They ban these things without the local capacity. And suddenly, Benin, a small country like Benin, their rice imports rose by 10 times. <laughs> of course, those being smuggled in. So you're just punishing the, 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 the urban dweller who is a customer of, of this by increasing the price. You don't help anybody. You have to be able to take your time and establish the local capacity. And I'm saying that in the next two, three years, we will have enough production capacity in Ghana to be able to say to anybody who is important that, look, I'm directing you go here. Because you see, fact of the matter is that if you have to import primary food into this country, I, in this office, have to give you a permit. Mm -hmm. And the regulations say that I have to, you have to come and get a permit even before you establish a letter of credit. Mm -hmm. That regulation has been trampled upon, and people are bringing these things in. And now they including bring, the poultry. Yes, including poultry mm -hmm. to Tema and Takrade, and then they come here for a permit. I tell them no, they are breaking the law. You should have established. I should have given you the permit even before you bring it in. You, you bring it in. Now you bring it in, and you want is a fate complete? Mm -hmm. I'm not prepared to do that. And that is causing them, I'm sending the signals to them that although though in those days everybody closed their eyes to you because there was no local nothing. But now the industry is, mm. is awakening to its potential. So we have to protect the local farmer against mm. the farmer of America and Brazil. And in what others. ways exactly are we doing this? We're doing it, I'm talking to them. For instance, uh, uh, on Monday, I had a meeting with the rice importers, all the uh, 15 biggest rice importers in this country. I told them, look, we, this is what government is doing. We are a private sector government. We support business, so we don't have anything against you. In fact, we want your businesses to bloom. But we think we can do it with local production, giving jobs to our farmers, and creating the jobs for our youth, and so on and so forth. Mm. They understand. But now it's a mechanic. You see, you have to be able to engage people. Mm. And we are doing the same thing with the poultry uh, uh, importers and so all that. So you're trusting that they will do it? No, no. Without government wielding no, the policy? No, no, no. We, 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 we are buying time. We want to establish the local, local capacity to produce what they are importing. Once you have the local capacity, oh, yeah, yeah, then, then the plan is what? Oh, yeah. The plan is that we say, hey, guys, stop. Stop importing rice. Stop importing poultry. poultry. Yeah, because we have uh, enough production locally. But until you have production locally, you're just punishing the, the consumer. And your plan is to... Turn this around in three years. Yes. So you're saying that in three years, if all goes well, yes, we will have a situation where we will stop importing and we will through policy. Yes. Stop importing rice. Yes. Stop importing um, poultry. Yes. That is ambitious. No, no. You always say this is I mean, ambitious. I, I, when when see, I say ambitious, I'm, I'm talking about over ambition. Ghanaians are be, very be, timid. You, be, see, be, when we, you see, some of us we know what we are talking about. It's not over ambition. Look. 
I mean, the, the capacity of this country, the endowment that we have, mm. if you really uh, professionally know what is the God has given this country, mm. you wouldn't say, oh, this is ambitious, this is ambitious. I'm saying there's that... There's something wrong with ambition, but yeah. there's something wrong with over-ambition. No, no, no. Isn't this over-ambition? No, no, it's ambition. Because of the... <laughs> because of the muscle that the uh, rice importation should, etc. Because of the they muscle have, they have. No, they don't have any muscle. These are powerful industries. Yeah, listen, in there. I, powerful I am the Minister for Food and Agriculture. They have to come to me by law. If we were to uh, implement the law strictly, where is their power? Hmm. They, are, they are breaking the laws of this country. And we say they are powerful? No. I'm the one the people of Ghana has given power to, to make sure that our farmers are prosperous, they are contributing their bit to the uh, prosperity of this the country. Free market economy. Yeah, yeah, no, yes. But it should be level playing field. Not that you, you go and buy Thai rice at uh, uh, $200 per ton, and then you go to your government the, the, the exporter goes to his government for another hundred and fifty dollars, mm. and then they land this thing here so that a kilo. When you go to the to you're the market, the risk of being accused of being protectionists. Oh, I mean, look, in, I the, mean, in the global economy, that can be dangerous. No, w H the W T O rules are very clear that if you can prove that the cost of producing and landing the goods in this particular place is far less than what it should be. Then you, have, you can have countervailing and uh, you know, all kinds of measures to protect. Mm. Let's talk about um, the mechanized aspect of the, of the plan, yes. um, which is a, a big deal too. Because if you really have to achieve all the uh, fantastic objectives you have, mechanizing is a key thing. Where are we in that? Mechanization is very, very important. Mm. But, um, so what we are doing is that we have a facility with the Brazilian and Indian governments. The implementation of the Brazilian facility has started. As I speak to you, we have received uh, 250 tractors, implements, all kinds of machinery to, that we are distributing to the district assemblies, to farmer groups, and so on. Uh, there's a last tranche to come from the Brazilian facility. Then we kick in the Indian facility, $150 million, mm -hmm. that next year will come. But we are shifting the whole emphasis away from the production end of the machinery to the agro-processing. Because at the moment, my nightmare is how do I manage the huge surpluses that I've engineered through this program? Mm -hmm. There is this outlet of exports to our neighbors, but the, what is left is so huge mm. that we need to process, to prolong the life of the product, to add value to it, to generate more jobs down the value chain, and to export the, the finished packaged product so that we can earn more foreign exchange for the country instead of sending it out raw, Ghana uh, beyond eight. Mm. So we are now shifting our emphasis, establishing agro-processing capacity. Mm. It's being done through the 1D, one 1F. One one but it's not, value. Yes, it's not enough. This ministry is also initiating a, a process so that we can build a capacity for milling our rice, for milling our maize, uh, packaging them, and all those things, cassava into gari and all that. I've been to Brazil. They, have gar they eat gar a lot of gari in Brazil. They do? Yeah, like us. I have yes. no idea. Yeah, yeah. So they are machines. They do gari soaking. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and no, actually. <laughs> <laughs> you remember your body day. I do, yes, absolutely. Day day. Yes, 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 yes. So, so they have machines which are very efficient that our women can use. So we are going to import a lot mm -hmm. of these into Ghana and give it through the Ministry of uh, 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 Gender to uh, uh, farmer groups uh, and so on, women groups around the country, so that we can increase the value addition to our cassava. We are doing a lot of uh, chips and plantain chips. All those things are coming into play. Mm -hmm. So they... they the, unlike the Brazilian facility, the, the, the Indian facility will emphasize agro-processing because we are generating the, the surpluses mm. in order as a means of managing the surplus. Okay, so that's what we are. Uh, so, with, so, with that that. Is, so that is uh, the mechanizing for food and jobs. Mm -hmm. Now, we have the last but a very strategic, the greenhouse villages. 
where we have uh, employed the services of an Israeli company, Agritop, helping us to establish these greenhouse villages in Dawenya, in Akumadan, in Ashanti region, and in Kaswa, and on the western side mm. of Accra, uh, each with 90 hectares of land, so that we, we are doing the core five hectares mm. of, the, uh, of, the, of the village, and we are inviting private investors, both foreign and local, to come and add to it. It's got a plan, you come, we give you a block, and all that. And through that, we want to be net exporters of uh, vegetables. Mm. To, to, if, to where? To, 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 to the EU part? market, yes. To yeah. the EU, I mean, there's a huge the, market, only six hours uh, uh, away. Yeah. But rather, they are important to us. I have to take you to Kutuka Airport on a Friday night. Mm. You'll be shocked the quantity of uh, vegetables that, that are being offloaded. Yes, exactly. We want to supplant that and do the local domestic uh, demand and then come into the the um, uh, export market to earn as a lot of uh, foreign mm. exchange like uh, Kenya is doing. Kenya is earning three billion US dollars every year from vegetables and cut flowers. I see. And we, we, and we are almost. And this is zero. coming on the back of us recently Vill being villages, uh, villages, the greenhouse villages, villages that I'm, I'm talking about. How many of these villages are you? Three, three of them. Yeah, these okay. are satellite ones, and you know. Uh, because of its intensity. And big enough to give you the volume. Oh, yes, yes, yes oh, def definitely. We, you know, Akumadan, we have 120 hectares. Mm. Uh, Dawinia, we have 90 hectares, and 90 hectares uh, in, in Kaswa area. Mm. If we're able to attract enough foreign, foreign and local investors to come into this mm. and fill the whole place up, we could be earning at least a billion dollars. Mm. Um, that is when you hear billion dollars for an economy like us, you have to <laughs> smile. And I guess, as I say, the devil is always in the deep. We're going to take another break. When we return, um, I, we'll talk about the fertilizer situation very, very shortly. And then we'll go into the, um, recently the ministry has also been involved in the Green Revolution agenda. Um, that has been, part, been made part of the, uh, of, the, of the agenda for the ministry. So we'll talk briefly about that as well. Um, stay with us here on PM Express. So on PM Express, my guest is still the Agri Minister, um, and thanks for staying with us, uh, Doc. Let me let me go into an area that I heard the President himself complain recently about the smuggling of of fertilizers. Um, he's very unhappy with it, knowing what you're doing. However, in spite of the concerns you have, um, the man who is seeking to displace you in the next election, John <laughs> Mahama, has been has been talking about the fertilizer policy, and and I want to quickly quote what he's been saying recently when he's been touring the region and then talking to farmers. He says, I feel very sad for our cocoa farmers, President Mahama said, adding, we, we had good plans and started implementing good policies for the cocoa sector. When we started giving our free fertilizers, it was because we realized it will help improve yield. And then he says that in 2016, 2017 crop year, we recorded 950,000 tons. I can't understand why this government would decide to stop that and sell the fertilizers to the farmers. Why are you selling the fertilizers? This question <laughs> will be to you. There's nothing in this world which is free. That's the underlying philosophy. So when the uh, Mahama administration says it's giving it out for free, it's only a propaganda, a propaganda gimmick. I was going around the country as the uh, ranking member for food, agriculture, and cocoa affairs mm. in the parliament of Ghana. And the consistent complaints I was getting was that they were not getting the fertilizer, they were not even seeing it. At the time, I remember, this NDC chairman of uh, Bodhi constituency mm -hmm. was complaining on, uh, on uh, Peace FM mm -hmm. that his people are not getting it, but rather other chairmen of uh, his party were getting it. So it was a party <laughs> matter, okay? But large majority of farmers were not were being denied. And where was it going? It was being smuggled out. Mm. And I remember Gosso when I held a rally for, for farmers, an old man who used to live in my father's area in Kumasi, and I retired to Gosso, came to the, to the forum, was saying that it makes sense to charge the farmers so they can have access to as much uh, fertilizer as they can afford. 
at the moment, if you have 20 hectares or one hectare of cocoa, you still get three <laughs> measures of fertilizer. And I felt very sad. And consistently, we were hearing this. I went to, I organized another rally in Sefriwi also in opposition, and it would turn out hundreds of farmers the same thing. So it's a, a politics of deception for Muhammad to say that free fertilizer, he doesn't understand. He doesn't know what will happen in reality on the ground. Mm. I thought now, that's yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> if you put, you see, farmers are not to be spoon fed. Mm. You see, I believe what we are doing now, subsidizing the fertilizer to the farmer, is only uh, to enable him to test the wonders of improved seed and fertilizer to increase his production by so many times over. Mm. And that the moment I withdraw it, he wouldn't say that because he's no longer buying the fertilizer at his, uh, 56 cities, but at 100 and something cities, he's going to stop. You, you're not saying you plan to withdraw it. Oh, no. I, of course, it's temporal. Of course. So eventually, farmers will have to buy the full cost of it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and listen, if you have to buy one bag and it's going to give you uh, four, five, ten times more, does it make economic sense for you to say because we've increased the price by 30% uh, or 50%, you're going to stop? No. He, the farmers are very calculating. Mm. Is the is the net that he gets uh, upon which he takes his decisions? But that will in definitely increase the financial burden. Of course, the, what, 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 no, no. But if you are bringing him a seed which will get him three, four times more. But he needs the fertilizer. No, the, yeah, yeah. But the thing is that uh, is in fact you educated there, me earlier yeah. that with the improved seeds, they yes. actually need more fertilizers. Yes, yes, of course. I mean, but if you withdraw the uh, subsidy even now, but, but, but they the pay the full cost. The, the, listen, that is no, going to no, be difficult no, for them no, to no, afford no, the fertilizer yeah. they need. No, 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 you don't understand. Let me explain to you. The cost, the total cost of production, the component of the fertilizer is so small. Because of labor intensity, the labor intensity of our uh, agriculture, the biggest item of cost is the cost of labor. Mm. Yes, I was telling you that poultry, 75 to 80 percent of the cost the of production is the feed. Mm. The same thing applies to, uh, you know, uh, the, the crops. Major item of cost is labor. So if you are subsidizing his inputs of fertilizer and, input and so on, that's only a, a small proportion of his total cost. And then on top of the total cost, he's going to get three or four times more revenue. So there is the net which is important to him, which makes him take his decisions whether to go on applying the fertilizer or not. You see, so we have to get these things in proportion, you see. Yeah. And so if and Muhammad I comes back... Understand. Of course. Uh, complex analysis. It's not, it's not complex. This is simple. Because you are not a farmer, you don't think that they think like you do. But they, mm. they of course, that's their career. But, but, but certainly, if I have to pay 100 CD plus mm. for a bag of fertilizer, mm. when I didn't use, I paid zero for it. No, no, not zero. Come on. I mean, I'm saying I'm we so, subsidize. And the Muhammad's time. <laughs> it, it, that's his argument to you. Yeah, but that the, is the, far no, better no, for the, the, the Muhammad argument, I'm saying that only a small percentage of the farmers were benefiting from the mm. zero. A large majority of them were not getting it at all. Or if they were getting it, they were getting totally inadequate amounts. Because what they do is that every, every uh, uh, farmer should get one baggage. Mm. Some farmers are doing 20 hectares, others are doing two mm. hectares. How can you give the same number? To, to them regardless of... Uh, so it was, it's a very inefficient system mm, it's that he was running. And when he talks about 900, I don't know where 950 uh, tons. We recorded 950,000 tons. Which year? Which year? It says 2016-17. That's not true. What are we doing? What is the current <laughs> figure now? What's the current figure now? Last year, we did 938,000. Okay. This year is dropped because there's a this cycle for commodities. It happens with high yield. The next year, it goes mm. down, it goes up. Is it because of policy? The policy well, intervention? No, what Maybe the fertilizers? No, no, no. But we, we applied it. We, they started buying it when we came in. Mm. And we, yet we had 900 that he's talking about mm. in 2017, 2018. Is the cocoa farmer better off today much than better before? Off. Oh, of course. In, in what specific ways? In the, in the way that now he can buy as much as he wants of the fertilizer, of the pesticides and all those things. Whilst under Mahama... He could, he, there wasn't enough because most of it was being smuggled. He himself had been But you should have smuggling under your watch. No, well. Well, that's a smuggling. Yeah, yeah, but it's because we have a hefty de, de, uh, 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 
subsidy. But we have taken measures this year, the smuggling is very minimal. Mm. Because one, we have our forces on the border because of the insecurity in Burkina Faso, that's one. Two, we've changed the whole system. All fertilizers going to the northern part are in 25 kilogram bags and not 50 kilogram bags. Mm. So it will take you double the effort to be able to do that. And, and thirdly, certain uh, 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 districts which are known to be smuggling districts, mm. we ban uh, the sale of, smug, uh, of fertilizers, uh, distribution of fertilizers in those selected districts. Mm -hmm. They had to come to the nearby areas to buy, so it made it more difficult. And uh, because of that, the, we, we, the, the smuggling this year, 2019, is to a trickle. Mm. And until you remove, and it's because of the difference in price between the two countries. I mean, mm. <laughs> Burkina is, now, is about three times more expensive mm. than Ghana, because, mm. partly because of our subsidy and partly because mm. uh, transporting it from the port to, to there is high haulage costs mm. and so on and so forth. Yeah. So obviously, if the difference is big, the smugglers get more profit and they're prepared to risk it. Mm. But because of all these measures we've, we've taken, we are satisfied that the smuggling is to, to the minimum. When President Mahama was in office, I remember I did a press conference after his press conference that uh, fertilizers are going as far as Cameroon. He himself admitted it. So he cannot come today and tell anybody that in his administration there was no smuggling. He himself, and I can, I still have the cutting of the graphic, I can show you. Mm. Yes. The African Green Revolution Forum uh, was, well, it was recently done. How did it go? It went very, very well. In fact, by all measure, it's been the most successful of all the nine years of his annual existence. You know, uh, uh, may he rest in peace. Uh, Busumru Kofianan uh, was the brain behind uh, Agra. And the first forum was held here in Ghana in 2009. Mm -hmm. And then since then, it moved from capital to capital. Mm -hmm. Since I've been in office, I've attended two. Mm -hmm. One in uh, Cote d'Ivoire in 2017, and last year with the president in Kigali, and this one here. And I can tell you, in terms of the turnout of numbers, in terms of the number of ministers, were, ministers of agriculture who came, we've broken all records by far. I mean, we had nearly 3,000 delegates, 2,870. I mean, the best they got was 2,100. And I had. Why do you think that is? Wait a minute. And I had 28 colleagues of mine, ministers of agriculture around the, 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 the continent, coming to this one. The highest they've gotten was 13. And it's all because of planting for food and jobs. When they came, I when had one to learn the Yeah, no, yes, because they they'd heard that how well we are doing and planting for food and jobs. They wanted to find out what are you doing differently that we can take back to our countries. And I had a one to one on, with most of them, not all of them, because twenty you can out in three four days, but we had a, a, a forum organized by the African Development Bank to have this kind of chit chat. And they, they, it's their curiosity which kills a the cat. They wanted to come and find out what is it that you're doing that is everywhere, everybody is. And, and that was what made me aware that, oh, we are doing something good in Ghana. I wasn't, to be honest, I didn't, I, I didn't know that we had that popularity with that uh, uh, brand of planting for food and jobs. So, so um, it was very successful. The kind of uh, discussions which went on uh, the quality of the discussions and the discussions and, you know, the first lady came on the institution thing. Her seminar was a roaring success. Um, the African Development Bank and the ADB itself, Rockefeller, sponsoring all these discussions uh, uh, about the, the future of agriculture in, on the continent, the green revolution that we've been looking for. I think that the conclusion was that uh, Africa was on the threshold of a breakthrough in mm. our green revolution. Mm. And I, I believe so too, that uh, if we carry and on... And is with, Ghana at the forefront of that? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the interest being shown on the continent is clear that uh, we Let are... Let me ask you a bread and butter question. Mm. I mean, you've talked in this interview a lot about the success of the plan for food and jobs mm. and the other modules. Mm. When will that inf affect the prices of what we buy on the market in terms of... You know, um, I, I don't know your marital status, but I'll call a partner. You don't go to the market. I should ask my wife. 
She would be the I best would, person to I answer ask, my question. I would ask you. That's, that's the last one before we go. The um, Farmer's Day is around the corner. Yes, um, And is there something for the farmers to really celebrate us here? What uh, is yes, making this I think, year I think the worth day, celebrating? Yes, the kind of bumper crop we've had around the country because of the resources we've thrown to them that they have grabbed with both hands and are doing a wonderful job, coming up with incredible harvests. And you know, God has blessed it with good rainfall. And even in the middle, end of October, still having rains and so on. I think farmers in Ghana have something to celebrate, yeah. you know, generally. Because when I was in Parliament, I was always against Farmers' Day. I thought, oh, well, there's nothing to celebrate. These farmers are getting poorer and poorer. Government is not helping them. So, cutting so this suddenly and that and there's that. enough to celebrate? <laughs> Sorry? So suddenly there's enough to celebrate. Well, I'm, I'm saying leadership. the evidence. Yes, I'm mean, planning for food and jobs is good for them. Say, well, they will repeat your, your cynicism that back what? in the day and say, well, there's nothing to celebrate. Well, then well. they don't have eyes for the evidence. If they do, and they're objective and intellectual enough, they will see that there's something happening on the landscape of agriculture in Ghana. Okay. And that is the uh, agri uh, minister who's been my guest on uh, PM Express uh, tonight, uh, Dr. Owusu Ifri Akoto. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Most welcome. Most welcome. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. <laughs>